So it's very gladdening and personally supportive to see uh, yeah, your the kind of resolve and uh, commitment that you're making, the energy that's being put into uh, coming to this particular session, coming in from the forest and uh, getting here on time and putting in the hours. So it's uh, a lot of uh, mudita appreciation for the goodness of that. It's a very uh, it's quite a special occasion. I find it just myself quite supportive to be really noticing and seeing summoners and uh, lay people and so on really uh, you know getting down to the heart of the practice for liberation <clears throat> so this is the kind of energy and application that bears fruit mm. because all of it is firming up awareness and uh, softening and sense of self allowing the sense of self separation defensiveness views, opinions, for this to subside. Mm. You remember what we really, with the teaching like a not-self, it's a kind of teaching that, you know, people who don't have a lot of practice really find themselves confused by, uh, what, well, no-self, what's this? Is it just kind of nothing? Well, you can put it another way, really, what's happening is that this substantial presence and clarity that's there, we don't call it self. We say this is quality of awareness, citta. As it's beginning to shake off its uh, hindrances, it becomes more apparent. Quality of firmness and presence and uh, capacity and... Uh, you know. But it why it's not self is it's not autonomous it's not independent from it doesn't really have a a fixed location mm-hmm. and it rises always independence always feeling independent on feeling consciousness impressions mm-hmm. noting those being with those And it's not a personality either. There's no particular personality, though personality arises within that. We can be aware of our personal configurations and tastes and preferences and history. And that's all fine, you know. Well, I mean, (laughs) the details aren't fine, but the ability to be aware of it is fine. (laughs) And uh, so in this way we begin to uh, address personal topics from a more enlightened perspective and see our way through those, clear some of the tensions and uh, frustrations and disappointments in all that, just by feeling it as it is, just exactly as it is, without saying I am this, (laughs) without that unspoken inference, this is what I am, you don't need to say that, you don't need to think that. All we need to recognize is this is the worry, this is the disappointment, this is the happiness, this is the opinion, this is the thought coming, arising, you know, in awareness. So it's that sense of real careful accuracy as to what's actually happening. And that's all, really. We're not trying to dispense with a self or negate a self. Just to say, well, you know, when you look at it clearly and accurately, you don't see one. You don't find one. What you notice is what awareness notices: thoughts, sensations, feelings, and energies. 
arising of passing. Mm. As we you know begin to acknowledge that, that sense of real clarity as to what's directly experienced. Obviously when we talk about it as a reference, as something that's just an abstract concept, we say, I'm feeling unhappy. <laughs> but when you directly experience, there's the awareness of disappoint, uh, unhappy feeling. You keep almost translating it that way, just as a skillful means, awareness of this, that and the other. Because that's actually how it is, isn't it? And what, how we want to translate that into conventional terms mm. has to be with clarity and patience and integrity and ethical responsibility and so on. Mm. There are four particular uh, places that you can, con- or points or themes or you can contemplate practice with um, to to get things clear and to free um, awareness from these uh, stuck places abiding agency mm, being that Being a self who abides, I am this, agency, I do this, Um, being affected, I am, this is happening to me, (laughs) and mastery, I could make it this way, I could stop having that, right? Abiding, I am here, uh, agency, I can do this. Being the object, this is happening to me. Mastery. I could do this. If only that, I'd be able to do this. If only that wasn't there, I'd be able to have this. <laughs> With a little more of that, I could make it this way. Yeah. Abiding, I'm stuck in this. I want to hold on to this. This is a good place. I want to be this forever. Or, I'm stuck in this, I'm trapped, imprisoned. That's suffering, isn't it? When you take abiding as self. Yeah. Agency, I'm doing this. When, you, when I am doing this, how well am I doing this? Am I doing it good enough? When do I get the results of what I've been doing? Hmm? When do I get the payoff for my actions? Did I do it well enough? Or is there a better way I could do it? Suffering. This is happening to me. I'm kind of impinged upon people, things, events, sounds, sights, contact happening to me. Suffering. Or something pleasant happening to me, I want to stay with that so that more of that will happen to me. Suffering. I'm the master of this, I could make this happen. If only I did this, I could get that to happen. I push harder, I make this this way. Oh, I made a mistake then, I didn't get it right. Suffering. (laughs) Yeah. So in these experiences, abiding, agency, being the one which is affected, and attempting to be the master, or held to and clung to, they generate two things. One is self, and the other is suffering. <laughs> But it's not to say there's no such thing as agency. 
yeah, you know, I, I can do it. I can lift a spoon. <laughs> I could write a letter. I could, you know. Yeah, there's agency. Mm-hmm. But as soon as it comes an I am around it, then the suffering. Yeah, there's a kind of abiding. Here I am. But uh, whenever there's clinging to that, then I feel trapped. Mm. Or I feel I've got to own and possess. I'm the colonizer. I've got to own it, possess it. I'm abiding. This is my place. Mm. So when it's clung to, even on a subtle level, my space, my quiet, my bit, my time, mine, wherever there's an abiding, subtle or gross, clung to. Yeah, I mean, there is some kind of abiding, but it's very, it's temporary, isn't it? We can't, there's a kind of shifting, it's like living on the ocean, really. Sometimes they're living in a washing machine. <laughs> But you can't, as soon as you cling, as soon as there's clinging, suffering. But there's some kind of abiding. Abiding in awareness, abiding in loving kindness. These are the best abidings, if you're going to abide anywhere. Or as the Buddha said, you know, the best kind of abiding is in neither perception or non perception. <laughs> but he said, I wouldn't even recommend that. Best thing is to not abide. <laughs> have no abiding. The mind free from abiding, this is deathlessness. Mm. Abiding. There's some kind of feeling of being impinged upon, affected, things happen to what? Mm. They happen to awareness. They happen to sensitivity, don't they? There must be, I don't know how, I mean, I think the mind itself is, is fundamentally, one well, of its fundamental functions is to filter out the huge number of impressions that could be happening to you any given moment through the six sense doors and through the mind door. Without that filter, I think we'd be crazy, totally flooded. How much do you actually notice, you know, Walking from here to the house, you know, the grass, the, the birds, the sunlight, the warmth, the coolness, the what you smell through your nose, what's thinking, your, what's happening in your mind or your heart. A percentage. So yeah, there's being affected, but by what? By what attention? Has, what's captured attention? What hasn't captured attention? What hasn't caught attention doesn't happen to me. And this is happening, isn't it? Something at the gross level. You know, you, you trip over something, didn't notice it. Hmm? You bump into something, didn't notice it. You ask somebody else what they saw and they saw something different that you didn't see. Oh, I was supposed to do that was. I know, we, you know, you didn't notice the uh, cleaning job aspect of it. You weren't didn't have that attention, somebody else saw it. How much do you really get affect? How much is actually happening to me? Percentage. So what kind of me is that? Accurately, we just know we're affected. There's an effect being affected by what attention brings in. And attention is affected by intention, by what we choose to bring to mind or what intention brings to mind you know what attitude what uh, our aims if you're an architect you'd see this building in a very different way than if you're a burglar and, uh, and if you're a meditator you'd see it another way your fundamental aim and intention would perceive this particular structure in very different ways Mm. Burglar, you'd notice where the locks are, no locks, what looks valuable. (laughs) 
meditate ev eyeing up the fat zafus <laughs> architect you're looking at the beams and the structure of the roof and you know, mumbling about joists and, tr- and, tr- and trusses <laughs> yeah so what do you see you know intention attention contact that's what happens actually isn't it contact means we there's something that rings a bell Hmm. so you look at the wall and I just see kind of vague biscuit colour thing if you're a builder you probably go oh look at that sand oh they've used sharp sand and you know because it would mean something different to you so who's that who's the affected one Attention, intention, and contact bring effect into into awareness. Who's the master? Who's going to say this is going to happen? Well, you know, on a good day, I can lift my leg. <laughs> I can lift my hands. I can move around. So I can do some. <laughs> but you know, trying to figure something out, I can't. I haven't got the brain for. I can't do it like to do it, can't do it. Yeah. Can we give me kind of logistical details and accountancy and I look at it and I'd like to know what this, all these figures mean. It's important, but I just can't get it. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. <laughs> the light goes out. You know, something wrong with me. Can't do it. Hmm. And then there's just the other, isn't it? There's this physical mastery. Remember, imagine Tita Dummo saying when he was here as a layman, he used to he was told off for bounding up the stairs three steps at a time. <laughs> and now <laughs> he can't walk, hardly walk up one step. What happened to that self? You know, what happens in your Eyes fade and you can't read things without your spectacles. What kind of mastery is there? Can you say, let's not get sick? Can you say, let my mind be this way, let my mind be that way? So, yeah, there's some mastery, but not much. And how frustrating it is. We cling to mastery. We just can't do it. Yeah. Or you think you can do it, you can do it some days and some days it doesn't happen mm. some days the mind doesn't sit down, doesn't quiet down and you plug away at it and you do this and do that and you, you know, God, I don't know. you know, and you try this and you try that and you try again and it still doesn't work and you give up and oh, then it settles down <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> That was the problem, <laughs> was the identification. <laughs> when you identify with being the master, then our relationship to experience isn't really very pure. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Sometimes you can and sometimes you can't, and it's knowing that flexibility. So when it isn't clinging to this, <laughs> We can notice when we do have some say, when we can do things, when we can operate, when we can make the mind behave, when we can do this and that and the other. Say, oh, that faculty is present now. The faculty of understanding is present. The faculty of samadhi is present. The faculty of clear comprehension is present. End of story. That's the mudita appreciation that this is happening if it's going to a good purposeful result and if it's led without clinging without I am then there's no hoarding, storing up congratulation, conceit or despair around agency
But it's not that one shouldn't have any agency. Agency is important, abiding is important. Mm. Being able to exert and make things happen is important. Abiding is important. But they're important but not to be clung to. They're important in that they help to purify awareness of its laziness, of its forcefulness, of its grabbing hold, of its running away, of its self-pity <coughs> and sorrowing, of its greed. So you kind of keep contemplating, affecting. Can I be with what's affecting? Can I be with that? Can there be awareness with that? What's the right response? What helps to be with this? What helps to be present? Not to be present, holding on, dominating, but not to just cave in and be absent. How to be present so that we can be aware, we can be responsive, we can bring forth, effort can come forth, clarity can arise. So it's, you know, it's, it's really not to dis- get rid of any self, but just to not bother with that particular sidetrack, which is a very confusing and uh, um, <clears throat> unsatisfactory sidetrack. Notice really what happens. Abiding. You know, when we contemplate, when we sit coming into the body, we can feel there is gradually a more peaceful abiding. Comes and goes in waves, of course, but over time and over years of practice, you know, sati, mindfulness, clear comprehension become more apparent and begins to uh, work with the dissonances in the body, the contractions and the low energy places and the places that feel very tense. You work with that, so it becomes more smooth, even, more fulfilled, unbroken. It becomes a place that one can abide in. There can be an abiding in that. A peaceful abiding. And the Buddha is saying, this is a peaceful abiding in the here and now. In this. Because to do that, one certainly has to have exercised and worked on a lot of mental attitudes, impatience and uh, laziness or whatever. So it's coming into a whole body. Definitely the mind has to do some shaping up to do that. Mm. awareness has to do some shaping up to do that so it's but then it's also the benefits of both bodily one feels a sense of bodily pleasure and mental psychological we feel more peaceful and one can sit with that uh, walk with that probably for many hours actually minimal movement even After a while, you, you, know, you can really feel you've got somewhere. <laughs> Just, of course, <laughs> a little <laughs> snag in it all, because then you want to hold on to it. <laughs> uh, clinging. clinging. If when the mind, when it does become more settled, the samadhi begins to build up, we contemplate. Use the time wisely. How is this? Who is this? How is this? Hmm. And I would imagine most of us who begin to experience in the body in a different way, become internal body. I don't mean the organs, the internal physical body, but the consciousness, 
the internal aspect of consciousness. So consciousness obviously can be manifesting in terms of sensations and so on, but it can also be the sense of that which knows or is receptive to sensation. Call this the inner aspect. It's much more like a field, a field of receptivity rather than particular discrete points that jump up. Hmm. Yeah. So, and as the body becomes more calm, your breathing becomes more calm, the points begin to subside. There's much less, uh, you know, pointed, hard edge stuff. It's more like a, a field of um, smooth um, energy, really. I call it energy because energy is not necessarily, it's, it's alive, it's, it's vital, but it's not jumping around doing things, but it's energy in terms, it's not a particular point. It's more like a fluctuating field that has the experience of um, gently pleasant um, um, and you contemplate there's nobody in there, is there? There's that. And it's we experience the the internal sensations begin to subside. And we may be left with a kind of frame, body frame, feeling the sense of the body having boundaries with this quality of subtle uh, uh, energy within it. Mm. This is kind of the, the fundamental setup of uh, awareness. Without this, there's no location. Without this, you're psychotic, <laughs> essentially, because there's no reference point. There's no sense of this is the me bit. <laughs> you know, that's there, and this is me. <laughs> So it acts as the, as the foundation for a, a sense of, of identity, hmm? having a quality of presence. You know, we have a sense of there's something here that this is happening to. Hmm? There's something here that's holding a space, and not just a notion. Without that, there can't be any basis for our identity. But with clearer understanding, we see there's this, which you can use as a basis for identity, or you can just let it be this. <laughs> you know, the presence. It doesn't have to add up all kinds of purely uh, mental stories onto it, because it's just this, isn't it? Just body presence stands by itself. It doesn't need to have opinions, it doesn't need to have a past, a history, a future. That's that's of another domain, isn't it? Presence is just being present. It's like the sheet of paper that you want to write on. And you can write anything on that paper, but the paper doesn't need to be written on. Yeah. It's just that. If you contemplate it more thoroughly, you realize, well, actually, though it is a kind of an abiding, it's, it's constantly changing, subtle fluctuations. And you come to the boundaries of what we experience as body, boundaries you know actually those boundaries are not outside of something they're inside it mm. you're aware of the sensations that we call the boundaries of our body say the pressure of the legs or whatever uh, is within awareness it's not at the edge of it it's within it Sometimes it comes very central, doesn't it, if it's painful. Hmm? 
So really it's no real boundary. It's a boundary as long as one perceives it as such. You're walking up and down, so you're doing walking meditation, you can experience what? It's quality of presence in the body, that's one thing. You obviously notice there's a visual field as well. And conventionally speaking, we say I'm walking up and down a path. But really, the visual field, with its colours and shapes, is a completely different domain than the body field, isn't it? I mean, you could probably rig up one of these um, virtual reality machines or systems where you could be looking at a screen and it would look, you would feel like you're walking through a meadow just because visual impressions would come and go. But you know you're not walking through a meadow because you don't experience movement. Your body movement isn't there. But that same visual experience can happen. So it's a separate domain from the body one. And normally our, our, we bring them together. We say that, that quality of sensation, which I call movement, and that visual impression, we we'll stick them together. Don't decide this, it happens. It synchronizes most of the time. Sometimes it doesn't. Going to pick a cup up. Oh, the intention was there, the visual conscious there. I didn't quite hold it hard enough. Broken cup. You get down to fine details, you realize those things are not exactly conjoined. They have to be conjoined. And normally the whole living organism does that by itself. You know, you see something, intention, your hand moves out, you see this thing with fingers on it moving out, <laughs> grabbing hold of something, taking the sensations, the pressures. Ah, oh, I'm holding it, lifting it up, experiencing the sensations on one level and the visual impression on the other. I'm holding it. Bring it to your mouth and the visual field disappears. It's too close. And the tactile field opens up and you experience these big lips. Suddenly your mouth becomes very clear, very strongly focused, and that does the fine navigation in the hand and the mouth, synchronizing. When it gets close up, the spoon or the cup gets close to your face, you can't see it anymore. But you don't poke it up your nose. <laughs> Actually, they're quite close, aren't they, the nose and the mouth. It's amazing, you get to this point, about an inch in front, it could go either way, couldn't it, really? <laughs> But it doesn't, because at that point, it switches over from visual to tactile. And the mouth kind of becomes extremely sensitive, and here I am, here I am. <laughs> and hand aims for that. Yeah? You notice that? That's what happens, isn't it? The consciousness is tactile consciousness, visual consciousness, auditory consciousness. They all kind of do a... a Synchronize. But in, innately they're not. They're separate domains. And what synchronizes them is awareness and intention and attention and sankara. These things synchronize them. They do that. Hmm. Bring it together. But there's somebody doing it. Imagine if you had to figure out every day how to put a spoon in your mouth with every bite. You know, every time you've got to learn how to aim for that hole. <laughs> but these do it automatically. And because of that, we don't really notice what's actually happening. Oh, I'm having a meal. That abstracts. Looking directly at it, noticing the synchronizations of these consciousnesses. Be aware of all of that. When you're aware of it, your awareness expands. It's not attached to being inside the body, outside the body. 
when you're walking up and down. If you're inside your body, how come you can see things out there? Hmm? If you're in here, how come you can see things out there? If you're outside your body, how come you can feel warmth and pressure? If you're not inside your body or outside your body, well, <laughs> where's your abiding place? <laughs> huh? it, yeah. So your awareness begins to widen, to take in all of it. And if you recognize that, you know, for mostly where our the abiding will be. Well, if something really interesting is happening in the visual consciousness, the abiding will be in that. You know, you're driving a car, you're cycling along, or you're walking along, you see something really interesting for a moment, you absorb into it. You have to be careful because you can lose awareness of your body. You go right out there. Hmm? Watching a television, watching a movie, whatever, you're right out there in, in those images. And body consciousness, forget it. Yeah. So one thing is to go right out. Lose that synchronization. The other thing is to go right in. So you're sitting there and meditating and somebody's saying instructions about work or duties, I'm not there. <laughs> I'm in here. Something I don't want to be with I'm in here. So we can completely absorb internally and not be aware externally. Mm. So really walking and sitting, just coming, I find it interesting being at the place where the two, those sense fields overlap or meet. Mm. Because this is often the place where an internal I am, when I am is heard internally, then how I relate, how it relates to the external, is that's where you know the clinging can occur. You feel defensive or eager or wanting or resisting. So just work at that edge where the internal sense meets the external sense. The sense of I am when it's held internally, you know meets that which is seemingly external. And you begin to soften, widen, relax at that place. Sometimes it can the external world can be rather um, unappealing, and even hostile, apparently hostile or unpleasant. So we tend to withdraw internally. Sometimes a beautiful day, something attractive, move out into it, want to more of it. Being at the meeting place. It's really, you know, helps to deal with or address the issues around abiding. As you know, if you're dealing with difficult situations, you know, difficult situations, testing situations. Something that wants to withdraw, 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 to not have to be with that. Mm. Yeah. Just going into a hospital, you see the kind of things that, that people have to be with. And uh, it's the strategies they adopt impersonality, calm objectivity in order to meet a constant flow of you know difficult or unpleasing um, experiences. Mm. So at the meeting place, is a place where we begin to tune to where the clinging is to push out or to pull back. Can we widen to include all of it? And 
work on that reflex of withdrawing or reaching out till it becomes open, clear. Now the sensations, the feelings, even the sense of being somewhere to arise, to move, to pass. So there is a liberation from abiding and of course from non you know, from withdrawing. You see the relativity of it doesn't mean one is absent, it just means that there's something very relative and changeable and flexible and relational about how we abide. I think really important to highlight that term relational because one way of looking at it is that the whole sense of self operates through an imperfect relationship. Clinging, resisting, holding on, rejecting. If that relationship, we see it as imperfect, we understand it as you know, driven with fear or with passion or with blindness or with assumptions or with domination or with lack of confidence, hesitancy. No, this is a relationship to experience that is not helpful. It is unsatisfactory. And if that relationship continues, whatever continues, whatever is made familiar and continual becomes myself. That's how it operates. It's not that I do it, it's just whatever becomes familiar and habitually operated is taken, is experienced as my self. It's my standpoint, it's my position. And something about that is extremely attractive to have a position. And you build up, one can build up a whole lot of opinionatedness in order to have a position and a standpoint and a way of conveniently rejecting some things and approving other things. Adopt an opinion, adopt a dogma, and you can say that doesn't count, only this counts. Because this fits my opinion, that doesn't. This is surely, this is, we see this happening because we are prone to this, our biases. Mm. And, uh, oh, you receive other people's biases and how people can be so thick (laughs) and opinionated and stubborn, (laughs) you know, because they've got hold of some bit of dogma they're holding on to. You have to live with that. And certainly in community you feel this kind of, you know, discomfort, somebody sticking to an opinion or a view. This is surely, this is suffering. This is self. It's not comfortable. It's not for one's own welfare, nor for anyone else's welfare. It doesn't lead to Nibbana. So working on that, relational level how is it to be with this can the distressing or the tenseness or the unwelcoming can that be understood and noticed as not beautiful not helpful not conducive and relinquished how does this happen we take advantage of the confidence that presence gives us the ease that calm gives us. Hmm? The willingness that joy gives us. We take advantage of these uh, uh, factors that arise through meditation. And it enables us just to move a little bit further into our discomfort zones and feel okay move a little bit further outside of me and mine and feel okay and feel oh 
it wasn't as bad as all that. <laughs> you know, a little bit of liberation, isn't it? Being with people wasn't as bad as my fear and self-aversion made it. <laughs> you know, actually, they're not as bad as we imagined. You know, once we, well, as long as we remain stuck inside those boundaries, we never even look beyond them. We form opinions about people and different kinds of people. form of opinions about ourself. So really, you know, training, when you see a boundary, when you see yourself, is that supportive now? You know, because it's true, the case is that until there is calm and confidence and presence and joy, it is very difficult to move through boundaries because we are constrained by our uncertainty and our feeling of not being very solid, substantial, can't take much, you know. So we have to, you know, that's the way, practically that's the way it is. People develop boundaries for a very good reason. Because they're internally so insecure and un, un, incomplete. Sort of like scrambled egg or jelly, you need a mold to put it in. But as the presence becomes strong, you don't need, you can get out of the mold, out of the jelly mold. <laughs> you know, because you're not jelly anymore. And it becomes, it becomes an impingement to be living with this kind of intense boundary of, you know, self-determination and independence and my way and you can't tell me and... I've got to have it this way, otherwise I'm going to sulk, kind of thing. Yeah. And then relationally, in easing through that. And we're starting in a very, <clears throat> you know, just like even fitting into group forms. Group forms is it's a challenge, isn't it, from our personal boundary? Well, it's something that we just like to kick back, actually, and bother and do things when I feel like it <laughs> but we're really you know that's so what is so encouraging to see the kids are really committing to you know softening that through working on that and through finding actually I get stronger through that not weaker as my strength and presence and clarity increase Actually, I, I don't need so much of mine anymore. Mm -hmm. This is one way to really assess the process. Wouldn't worry too much about the thoughts, the silly thoughts, the twittering thoughts, and the emotional pangs that come up as we reflect on life. It's like that, but really looking at how one can begin to be more encompassing of difficult states and things that don't seem to be going very far, just be encompassing and not stuck in them, but actually aware, breathing through them, feeling your way into that, softening the edges, so you become more, less... You're more present, more alive, less constrained. Mm. This is the way, isn't it? The mind, the awareness that is not abiding in a position, not clinging to a position, <coughs> not clinging to agency. <coughs> Recognizing what happens, what comes in, what is affected is the heart, awareness, whatever you want to call it. And a sense of compassion and uh, coolness, dispassion around that, rather than grabbing and rejecting. And through really healing our relationship to experience, you don't need to make a self out of it. 